Um, you can open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4 uh, as we begin this morning to look at a passage from one of my favorite books of the Bible. This morning we'll be in Philippians uh, 4, 1 through 7. Uh, let's read that together. Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Eudia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you this morning, we appreciate the opportunity that we've had to worship and to praise you, to echo back our heart's desire for you to be known and to share the love that we have with you. Now, Father, as we settle in to look into your word, and we pray that our hearts will be soft and sensitive to what you have to say in your word. I pray that um, you will use me to communicate what you want to communicate and nothing else. And that as we see you in your word, that we will leave here today a changed people because of who you are. We pray these things through your son and by your spirit. Amen. As we begin reading Philippians chapter 4, and start in verse 1, there are some things that should strike us as we begin reading. The verse starts all out and says, therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. One of the things that would likely jump out at us is the words that Paul is using to describe the Philippian church. He calls them not just brothers, my brothers, whom I love, and not only love, but long for, my joy and my crown, my beloved. As Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, he's writing to not just a church, he's writing to a church and a group of believers who he's very close to. Philippi was the first city that Paul went into when he started taking the gospel to Europe. They had been very supportive of his ministry financially, and even just recently as he's been in prison, they sent one of their leaders, Epaphroditus, to minister to him during that time. In addition, they had been examples of caring for the body of Christ um, at a distance when they sent money also to Jerusalem to help there. The Philippian church has been a model of health in the early church. However, throughout this epistle, Paul has been encouraging them to a couple of things. These, this healthy church that he loves, he's been encouraging towards two things, towards unity and joy, and that's going to continue in our passage today. So what does he point them to? In verse 1, other than his words greeting them and the transitional therefore, there's really only a couple of words that say this, stand firm thus in the Lord. This is a command. Paul is commanding the church in Philippi to stand firm. Clearly, this is figurative language. He's not simply asking them to stand up. Although standing may be a little more difficult than we often think about and give credit to. In fact, some of you may have been reminded of that in the past month as you've been um, online or Facebook or other places and you've seen videos circulating because there's a video that's been circulating a lot in the past month from the Wilds uh, Conservation Center in Ohio where a baby giraffe had just been born. And the video is of the baby giraffe trying to stand up. And everyone loves it because it's cute and you're watching this little thing and it's got these long spindly legs. It tries to stand up, it falls on its back and they just go everywhere. Standing is harder than we think, just natural standing. In fact, if you don't think it's true for a giraffe, just think about how it's true for us as humans. How long does it take us to even learn to do something as simple as stand? Standing is more complex than we think. However, the standing that Paul is calling us to is even far more complex than that. In fact, he's invoking a military term here. And it's a defensive term. It's a term that means to stand your ground, to not give up what has already been taken. When I think of that, my mind instantly has an image in it that comes from a movie 
one of my favorite movies of all time, the movie Braveheart. In this scene, it's the first time that the Scotsmen who are fighting for their independence from Britain meet on the field of battle. And the Scotsmen are a small ragtag army of mostly foot soldiers where the British are coming and they're bringing their heavy horses. It would be the equivalent of footmen, soldiers trying to take on tanks today. But their leader, William Wallace, has a plan. He doesn't know if it works, but he has a plan that he hopes he, that will work. And as the heavy horse charge, their thunderous hooves ringing out as they charge towards that line of Scotsmen, you can hear William Wallace saying, hold, hold, until the right time to spring the trap. That holding of that ground is the same thing that we're called to in this passage when it tells us to stand firm. It's saying, don't give in, don't give up, don't turn tail and run, hold on to what God has already given you. And so what is it in this chapter that God has given us? We see that in verses two and three, and it shows up first in verse two when it says this, I entreat Iodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Clearly, these two women, Iodia and Syntyche, are having a disagreement of some sort. The text doesn't tell us what the disagreement is, just that it exists. And what Paul is doing here is he's entreating them to come together. He's entreating them to agree. Entreat um, is a word that means he's encouraging. He's really more even urging, possibly even begging. He's begging them to come together. And we see the importance of this, just not even in that term, but the way he uses it. Because Paul doesn't say this, I entreat Iodia and Syntyche to agree. He says this, I urge Iodia and I urge Syntyche to agree. Paul is pushing at unity here. Agree is the same word that's used previously in Philippians 2 that says this, make my joy complete by being like-minded. And he expounds on that even. Having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Paul is not just calling them to get along. He's not calling them just to play nice together. He's calling them to be of the same mind. One commentator puts it this way. He's calling them to a total harmony of life. But Paul is not calling for a generic one. As he's calling for them to agree in the Lord. We saw that phrase already because we saw Paul commanding them to stand firm in the Lord. And this phrase is going to be repeated throughout. When there's a command within the Lord in Paul's writing, it typically means this. It means because of what God has already done through Christ, this is how you should live. Because Christ has taken our sin and died and given us life, our life should be lived to him and this is how it looks. It should reflect who he is. So Paul is calling them to agree, just like the father and son agree. Why does he call them to agree and use the word stand? Because our job as believers is not to create unity. Unity has already been created. In the passage that Charlie read earlier from, um, from Ephesians chapter 4, it says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. That's almost the same identical idea as in the Lord. I call you to be in the Lord. With all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We are called to stand firm in preserving the unity that Christ has already made when he atoned for us and brought us together into his family. In fact, Paul sees this as so important that he starts by asking you, and Syntyche, but then in verse 3 he says this, yes, I ask you also, true companion, we don't know who that is, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. He calls um, his, his, uh, his true companion to help them if they can't resolve it because he understands the nature of division and he understands how easily division occurs. In fact, you can see in this verse something about Iodia and synthesis. They are not just 
women. They are believers. We can see that because their names are written in the book of life. And they're not just believers. They're, they're strong believers, Paul's arguing. He calls them women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel. He knows them personally. They're mature believers, yet something has driven a wedge between them. What's interesting or sad, depending on how you look at it, is the things that can drive wedges between God's people. I went online just out of curiosity and, and Googled um, things that split churches. And I found a reputable writer who I know who brought up a list of things. And the things that we can separate about are ridiculous. Some of the things that he listed were things like um, whether or not to buy a filing cabinet. Really? If there should be a clock in the church, which I know you're all thankful for because it keeps us on time, but should there be a clock in church? Or, or my favorite, is it okay to use cran grape juice in communion? A fight over the right, the ordinance, that's meant to most demonstrate the unity that we have with Christ and with one another. You see, no matter how mature we are, disunity can creep in. And disunity, again, is that like-mindedness. In fact, this is why Paul used the military term of standing. It's a battle and a reality of difficulty that we must be vigilant to maintain. When I think of unity and I think of Trinity Bible Church, um, as the elders and I are looking at Trinity, we become aware um, of some things. We don't have rampant disunity. There aren't tensions uh, that we know of. But unity, a oneness of mind, may not be um, as strong a point as we think. Because you see, unity requires a common goal. It requires time together and participation in that. And as we are looking at ways to maintain the unity we have in Christ in Trinity Bible Church, we realize that requires us to have time together. And we're often siloed out at Trinity Bible Church into different groups maybe nowhere else as visually as on Sunday morning between our two services. In fact, after I shared this with the first service, I had a couple of people come up to me and say, yeah, I don't even think I know who most of the people in first service are. We are not together. We are not unified. We are not moving together as well as we could. So it's our goal to provide more opportunities for crossover through events um, that you'll hopefully be hearing about in just a few weeks, and also maybe even to have one week where we do something I can't remember the last time we did, which is have us all worshiping together. We want to maintain the unity. How do we do that? Paul gives us three ways to do that in the next few verses of four through seven. He gives us three imperatives, three things we must do to maintain unity. The first is found in verse 4 where it says, um, it says this, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. This verse has always struck me. In English, the first half of the verse contains five words. Yet Paul still feels the need to repeat this uh, thought using just four more words. Not only that, but just one chapter earlier, in chapter 3, Paul wrote, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Why is that? Because the thing that he's calling us to is not an easy thing. First, he's calling us to rejoice in all things or at all times. Um, that's not easy, especially in difficulty. How is it that we rejoice in difficulty? Not only that, if we're honest, we're better at complaining than we are at rejoicing. It's more natural to us. In fact, so much so that this command may even sound unreasonable to us, the idea that we're to rejoice. So how is it in difficulty that we can rejoice? Well, Paul says this, we're to rejoice in the Lord. Again, it's in remembering who God is and what he's done for us that lets us rejoice whatever the situation is our rejoicing isn't dependent on the circumstance, it's dependent on the person of God. And we can rejoice in who he is and what he has done no matter what. And as Paul writes this, this isn't just simple words for him. He's suffering, he's in prison. As he writes this to the Philippians, um, 
Life isn't easy for them. They are facing persecution. He's in prison, and as we said, their leader, Epaphroditus, one of their leaders, had gone to see him and had gotten so sick that he almost died and they're separated from him. Yet it's in that context that Paul can rejoice throughout the book of Philippians. He can rejoice in things like this, that he's been saved through faith, that he can participate in God's work, that God supplies our needs, that others are coming to Christ. He can rejoice in the fact that God causes all things to work for his glory. He can rejoice in the fact that death is gain when our life is in Christ. He can rejoice in the fact that whatever comes, he still and we still have access to the throne of God. There's much there to rejoice in. Paul also realizes um, that in rejoicing, there is power. Um, In fact, so much so that G.F. Hawthorne puts it this way. Paul believes that if only the Philippian Christians will obey his call to rejoice, they will discover that the positive Christian attitude will save them from the ills that plague their church. And he's right. In fact, everything else we're going to see is contingent upon rejoicing. The other two commands are contingent upon our ability to rejoice. And rejoicing is powerful partly because it's contagious. You see, even when I say the word rejoice, we don't think this. We don't think I'm just rejoicing by myself because we understand if we're really excited about something, if we're really rejoicing in something, we can't keep it to ourselves. We need to go tell other people about it. And when we go tell other people about it and they see what God is doing, even in the midst of difficult times, they can't help but rejoice along with us. Paul understands the power of rejoicing. We need to keep our our eyes fixed on Jesus and remember all that he is doing so that it can drive us to unity um, because rejoicing is infectious. We recognize this, and, and one of the trials is always, how do we become more rejoicing? How are we aware of all that God is doing? As we were thinking through this as a staff, Um, One of the things we decide is if you walk into the church office, right on the left, the wall right there, there's a black dry erase board, and we put that up there just for the purpose of being able to record the things that we're thankful for, things that God has done, or things that God has provided, things as big as grace, things as small as caffeine, and everything in between, that we can remember God's faithfulness to us and rejoice in it. The second imperative is this, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, the Lord is at hand. When you read the command to be reasonable, you're probably thinking this, oh, that's much easier than the first one. After all, none of us think we're unreasonable, right? That's not what this word is referring to. In fact, it's often translated as gentleness or meekness in other translations, but it's a really hard word to translate. In fact, one commentator, Melek, writes this. No single word translates epi case well, and commentators consistently insist that the word contains an element of selflessness. The gentle person does not insist on his rights. Or O'Brien, epi case here signifies a humble, patient steadfastness, which is able to submit to injustice, disgrace, and maltreatment without hatred or malice, trusting God in spite of it all. That word means a whole lot more than just seeming reasonable. In fact, it's interesting because of the three imperatives for unity, you're probably really familiar with two, rejoice at all times, and then the third one is um, don't be anxious but in everything, um, take your requests and make them known to God with thanksgiving. You're probably really aware of those, but you may not be aware of this one that's sandwiched right between them. Why? Because it's hard because it's countercultural, it's difficult. And a culture that tells us never to let them hold you down or to never let them take advantage of you, this doesn't seem to make sense. But we're meant to not only be reasonable, but we're called to be so reasonable that when people think of us, they think that's who we are. It should be known to everyone. Why? Why? Treating others as better than ourselves is essential for unity. And not only is it central for, uh, central, essential for unity, 
Christ is the ultimate example of it. Continuing his statement of what this word means, Melek says this, it is that considerate courtesy and respect for the integrity of others which prompts a man not to be forever standing on his rights, and it is preeminently the character of Jesus. Jesus who came not to demand what he was due, but to come in gentleness, in meekness, and to lay down his life as a lamb for the ransom of many. Gentleness is not weakness, it's strength. It's being strong enough through Christ to give up what we believe is our right, what we think we deserve in order to serve someone else and count their interests as more important than us. And Paul knows this will be hard for us, and so he includes an encouragement when he says, um, the Lord is at hand. He's reminding us of this, that we're called to be gentle, and the one who is the epitome of gentleness and calls us to that because of what he's done for us is coming again soon. Do you demand your rights or are you willing to give up your perceived rights for the benefits of others? The third imperative, well, the first imperative was to rejoice at all times. The second is to let our reasonableness be known to all people. The third is this. Um, Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. This verse gives us a prohibition of not being anxious and then the imperative of doing something about it. It gives us a problem and a solution. Interestingly, this is the only of the three that does that. And why is that? Well, rejoicing, we understand and we know we need to make a decision to simply rejoice. Um, through the power of Christ. When it comes to being uh, reasonable, we know, again, that's choices that we make with Christ through the power, through His power and the power of the Spirit. However, when we begin to think about anxiety, anxiety is a little different because anxiety is something that grabs onto people and grabs onto us and holds on and won't let go like a junkyard dog. In fact, according to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, nearly 40 million adults in the U.S. or 18% of the population, nearly one in five, struggle with some form of anxiety or depression every year. Another estimate from the National Institute of Mental Health estimates that 31% of U.S. adults at some point in their time will experience depression or acute anxiety. Why does Paul tell us not to be anxious? Because anxiety is the antithesis of unity. You see, I don't know about you, but when I experience anxiety and I'm living in that anxiety, who am I focusing on? Who am I seeing? Me and my attention. It doesn't allow me to be present in other people's lives. It doesn't allow me to serve them the way that God calls me to. Why? Because I'm so worried about what's going on around me. Paul calls us to give up our anxiety because when, if we don't, we harm the unity of the body. So what's the solution? What's the solution to anxiety? If you said prayer, you're half right because he does tell us to pray and he does tell us to make our requests and our needs known to him, but he doesn't tell us just to make our requests known. He says to make our requests known with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, remembering how God has met our needs in the past, remembering his faithfulness to him, taking those requests to him and laying them at his feet, understanding that whether he answers them how we want him to answer them or not, that he is still faithful. And when we understand that and the faithfulness of God and we've rejoiced in that, then we can um, help to address our anxiety. When I think of this, I think of um, a story that I just heard recently from Rebecca Jones as we were talking about the memorial for Barbara. And she told me a story I had never heard. And when Barbara was young, um, Barbara's family didn't have a lot of money. And so Barbara didn't have um, nice clothes. She didn't have nice things. In fact, her dress that she had um, and all her clothes were were patched. They were darned. They were... um, they were repaired. She didn't have a piece of clothing that was just new. 
And so as a little girl, Barbara thought about that, and she said, you know what? I want a new dress. I'm going to take this prayer request to God. And she took it to God. Soon after that, um, a bag showed up with a bunch of new clothes for Barbara. Barbara says it was at that point that she knew who God was and how close he was and that she could trust him with all her cares. And from that point forward, as she took her prayer, uh, took her needs to him in prayer, she did it with thanks because she remembered what he had done before. When we do these things, um, when we're faithful in the Lord, verse 7 gives us a promise. It says this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. While there's no promise that all our problems will go away, in fact, we know that's the opposite, we receive a promise that the peace of God will be with us. The very peace that God himself possesses will be ours. And it's a unique peace. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding that when knowledge falls short of giving us the answers we need or when we've gotten the proper answer but it falls short of meeting the need that we have, we still experience the peace of God. And the peace of God does something unique for us. It says this, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's interesting, that word guard is another military term. And I think what Paul is reminding us of is this. When we're standing our ground to preserve the unity that he's created and our attention is focused on the things that are assailing it and we have a line, technically we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable from our sides and we're vulnerable from our back. But the peace of God and God's presence is there to guard us. Literally, it's saying God has our back. Paul's, as a silver writes, Paul's antidote is very clear. Let joy take the place of your discontentment and anxiety. Look away from yourselves to the needs of your brothers. Be willing to yield your rights and privileges for their sake. And as far as your needs are concerned, bring them all before God in an attitude of thankfulness for what he has already given you. Like Philippi, there's things every church needs to work on. Standing firm in the Lord in unity is one of them. We need to maintain that unity that Christ worked so hard to create and that we can so easily destroy. So let's rejoice in the Lord. Let our gentleness be known to everyone and seek the end of anxiety through prayer. Often, when we end a sermon, we charge you with things, and then we sing a song and leave, but we don't get time to think about what those things may be in our lives. So before we sing our last song, I want to give us all time to stop and to think and reflect. Um, You may want to write down some of the thoughts that you have. Um, So if you want to pull out a piece of paper and a pen, that's fine, or use your phone, that's fine. Um, But I want us to to bow our heads and to close our eyes and begin to think about what it is that God has called us to in this passage in preserving unity. And I'm going to guide us through some thoughts. First, is there anybody in the body of Christ with whom you have a broken relationship? And if so, who is it? Our passage this morning, God pleads with us, implores us to make it right. What would it take for you to make that relationship right? Maybe you can't think of anyone. And if that's true of you, I want to ask you this. Is there anyone you're aware of who has a broken relationship with a brother or sister in Christ? How can you help them in healing that relationship? If you're not the right person, who is?
What can you rejoice in today? Stop and take a minute and begin listing out in your head or on your paper the things that you have to be thankful about, even if life is difficult right now. In what relationships or areas of life do you need to make your reasonableness or gentleness known? How are you doing at taking your anxiety to God in prayer with thankfulness? If something's pulling at your heart with anxiety or difficulty or fear, take a moment right now to take it to God in prayer with thankfulness. Father, we thank you for the reality of the unity that you've created in us as brothers and sisters in Christ. May we live well to preserve and maintain that unity so that as we do, the glory of your name will be known. We pray these things through your Son and by your Spirit.